So, Christmas time once again, my friends. Now, I'm sure you're all hyped up after spending time with your family, opening up your Christmas presents, sharing a little tender moment with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and of course, if you're like me, you're probably very, very lonely and in need of entertainment. So, what better way to spend your Christmas night than to kick back with some Scully Reviews action? And since last year I covered the original Metal Gear, I figured I'd make it a yearly tradition for me to look at a Metal Gear game every Christmas. Furthermore, this also probably brings to mind a few questions from some people, which, given the time frame in which I'm uploading these reviews, might be bizarre to some people. The most prevalent example of which being why I'm reviewing Metal Gear games around Christmas time. And more to the point, why not just skip the first two games entirely and head straight up to Metal Gear Solid, since, well, that's generally the game that everybody starts the franchise off with. The answer to both of these questions will be answered in the review, so if you're feeling a little bit down this Christmas night, allow me to lift your spirits, so on that note, grab yourself some chips and dip, crack open a Pepsi, and join me as we dive into Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Roll the theme song. of the original Metal Gear in the West, development for a sequel was in the works, culminating in the game that we know of today as Snake's Revenge. Now at this point in his career, the leather jacket wearing badass known as the 80s Hideo Kojima wasn't really looking to make a sequel to Metal Gear. That is, until he heard from a co-worker who was a part of the development team for Snake's Revenge on a train ride that the game was in production. As a result of this, Kojima managed to cook up a basic storyline by the end of the train ride and strolled up to his superiors at Konami and was given the go-ahead to produce a sequel to the game on the MSX. From this point on, Kojima was driven to push the MSX to its limits as he sought to revolutionise the game with more immersive gameplay and improvements that go leaps and bounds above the first game, but that's a lot of stuff that I'll cover once I get into the gameplay segment. There are quite a few other bits and pieces of the development history that I have left to talk about, but a lot of that I feel is a little bit more relegated to the technical aspects and the gameplay side of things, so I'll save my thoughts on that for then. So, for the time being, let's dig into Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake and see what kind of adventures that Solid Snake has gotten himself up to ever since the Out of Heaven Uprising in 1995. So, like last time, since there aren't a lot of people who typically tend to go into detail with the MSX Metal Gear games, I'm gonna make the occasional diversion from the plot where I exposit a little bit more about the characters you meet in the game. I do this mostly because, in Metal Gear 2 especially, there is some really good stuff on display here, and honestly, like with the greatness that is Dirty Duck, I feel the need to show this off. Anyway, the plot kicks off in 1999, four years after Big Boss's death, and after the events of the Outer Heaven Uprising, Solid Snake, now retired from Foxhound, promptly suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, and is forced to deal with the trauma in the wake of Schneider's death, alongside all that had transpired with Big Boss and the TX-55 Metal Gear. With only a brief period of working for the CIA so he could earn enough money to retire on, Solid Snake is eventually called back into action by Foxhound's new commander, Colonel Roy Campbell- oh, I'm sorry, Colonel Roy Kian Bell. His mission? To rescue the scientist Dr. Kiyomov, known to his friends as Dr. VRAM01K, who was a scientist who was responsible for the development of Oilix. Oilix, of course, being a newly developed bioengineered species of algae that is able to produce petroleum grade hydrocarbons with little expense or effort to produce, thus solving the world's oil crisis. And of course, with this new discovery, Dr. Marv was kidnapped by soldiers from Zanzibar land a nation that resides in Central Asia, and seeks to control the world's oil supply by threatening the world to launch a stockpile of nukes that they have in their possession, as well as taunting the possibility that they have a new Metal Gear available to ignite the engines of war. Everybody got that? And that was just the prologue to the game. And if you couldn't probably tell by this video's length, we have so much more to cover in terms of this game's story. Joining Solid Snake in his mission is Colonel Roy Kianbell, Mission Commander Extraordinaire, Eggs Benedict McDonald Miller, Master of, um, actually I don't really know what he's the master of, but goddammit he's got some wicked sunglasses, dude. George Kastler, Diane's replacement on Snake's enemy intel. And Holly White, a CIA agent posing as a journalist to infiltrate Zanzibar land. 
here to provide aid to Solid Snake's mission. With their powers combined, they are... Foxhound! The series. Yeah, a bit disappointed that we don't actually get to see the return of characters like Diane or Jennifer, but the fact that we actually get to see a little bit more of Foxhound outside of Grey Fox is a nice touch. Anyway, upon infiltrating the Zanzibar Land military compound, Snake makes it into the control center, where he gets to listen to the Zanzibar Land national anthem. Now you know why this is a Christmas review. Digging deeper into the facility, Solid Snake comes across Dr. VRAM, who, as it turns out, is in fact not Dr. VRAM, but instead our first boss of the game, in disguise, known as the Black Ninja. Now I know what you're thinking. This is gonna be the part of the Metal Gear review where I break synopsis and then go back into the background history of each and every character, since after Metal Gear 2 I'm pretty sure Black Ninja would never appear again. But... In this case... That's an exception to that. <laughs> After defeating the Black Ninja, he reveals himself to be none other than Kyle Schneider. As in the same Kyle Schneider who was killed by Big Boss and Out of Heaven after he discovered his secret identity right before Snake fought against Dirty Duck. Well, can I have to admit, this kind of broke my heart. Now, I know what a lot of people might be thinking. What the fuck? This is an 8-bit character who has no personality or cutscenes dedicated to him, but in all honesty, Schneider's story is actually pretty tragic. I mean, as we already know from the first game, he was once the leader of the Outer Heaven Resistance movement who had fought, bled, and died to avenge his wife and child, who were killed in the crossfire as a result of Big Boss's actions. In the aftermath of stopping the TX-55 Metal Gear, Schneider reveals that NATO had bombed the facility to shit, killing not only the soldiers, but also the Resistance fighters and children who were all trapped inside. Because the one who saved Schneider from an Annihilation was somebody who forgave him for what he'd done against him, and in turn gave him, the survivors, and war orphans a new place to call home in Zanzibar land. For the sake of keeping things spoiler free for now, let's just call this man Jack. And the biggest gut punch of all is that Schneider refers to Jack as a wonderful man. This is what he says right before the man dies. Okay, my angst over Schneider's death aside, from this point onwards, I was hooked into the game's story. I mean, we've already got our setting mapped out with Zanzibar Land being a place where war orphans and combat refugees live on as soldiers and civilians, but in turn, we also see our ally now turned enemy with Schneider working under the command of somebody who scorned him in the first game. And on top of that, we also see the fallout of what happened with the TX-55 Metal Gear, showing us that in the aftermath of war, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Suffice it to say, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake's plot is definitely much more involved than its predecessor, and to be perfectly honest, on the MSX, especially during a time when video game plot was absolutely limited, I gotta say, I'm thoroughly impressed. Anyway, before he dies, Schneider tells Snake to locate Dr. VRAM's cell by following the patrolling guard elsewhere in the facility. Upon following Schneider's instructions, the guard leads Snake out to a holding cell on the outskirts of the main building, where he finds somebody banging against the wall, which is meant to prompt the player to use a tap code. Something that, admittedly, in 1990 must have been a pretty cool feature to have considering the fact that it would have promoted real-world-to-video game interaction. But, considering that it's 2017 now and Metal Gear 2 was all but forgotten by the video game public, I think it's about time you break out that Christmas walkthrough. After deciphering the tap code via GameFAQs, Snake discovers that Dr. Madnar is being held prisoner here as well. It's been a long time, eh, solid Snake? As it turns out, Dr. Madnar and Dr. VRAM have a history together, going as far back as the Prague Academy when they were students there, and the two were captured while they were in America. Dr. Madnar goes out of his way to reveal that Dr. VRAM was moved from this building off to a tower a few days ago. Snake, can you guess where they left me alive? They must need you for something, and that means... Yes, Metal Gear! Snake, it's here in Zanzibar land. They've already completed a new Metal Gear. The one you destroyed three years ago was only a prototype. On top of that, Dr. Manor also mentions that they plan to mass produce the new Metal Gear models, known as Metal Gear D. And the cherry on top of all that information, which as Snyder alluded to earlier, is that the one behind this soul is none other than Big Boss. The very shame. With Metal Gear and Oilix, he plots to rule the world! We cannot let the secret of Oilix fall into his hands! With Dr. Manor revealing that Dr. VRAM is an absolute pussy when it comes to torture, he tells Solid Snake to find a female agent of the STB, and join up with her to rescue Dr. VRAM. Making his way forward, Solid Snake encounters the second boss of the game, The Running Man. The Running Man was once a famous short-distance Olympic sprinter, who gained fame for his running talents at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. However, his career was cut short after he was caught using dope. And so, like all Olympic drug abusers, he decided to become a terrorist. 
What? Don't you see the natural progression from being an Olympic runner to becoming a terrorist? All of which subsequently led him to being hired by Big Boss as one of Zanzibar Land's mercenaries. And for another one of Scully's fun facts of the week... This is actually Hideo Kojima's favourite boss in the entire Metal Gear series. But suffice it to say, the Running Man is no short maker by any means, so Solid Snake manages to take him out with ease, leading him to his next destination where he confronts a high-end helicopter, which is quickly disposed of by means of Stinger missiles. Afterwards, by posing as a cardboard box, Solid Snake infiltrates the tower, where he's then contacted by Holly, who reveals to him that she's been taken prisoner after her identity has been compromised, which is, of course, shortly after she's been contacted by Dr. VRAM. But again, if I could go off topic for a second, one of the most unsettling things about this place is, honestly, the abundance of war orphans running about the tower. More specifically, the ones with lines such as, The one-eyed man is like our daddy. He doesn't like grown-ups. And maybe this is just me speaking on a personal level here, but honestly, this is some incredibly powerful stuff. I don't know, there's just something that just feels all too real just to see such a young child look upon Big Boss with admiration, because they see him as some sort of a father figure to guide them against the grown-ups who harmed them prior to their circumstances of ending up in Zanzibar land. And you want to know what the funny thing is? That was all just from one line of inconsequential dialogue. But for what it's worth, that one line of dialogue had meant far more to me than a good chunk of all the other schmaltzy, overdone crap that Kojima would later write in for the other Metal Gear Solid games. But anyway, after finding Holly, we then get our taste of flirty banter. I never thought you'd be this pretty. And somewhere out there in the world, Diane is shaking her fist in anger. Holly informs Snake that she managed to contact Dr. VRAM by means of Carrier Pigeon, thus leading to the two splitting up as Holly attempts to gain more intel on Zanzibar land, while Snake goes off to hunt himself a pigeon. In the meantime, Snake also has a run-in with the fourth boss of the game, Red Blaster. Red Blaster was an explosives expert who worked for the Spetsnaz before he was eventually coerced into joining Zanzibar Land. Normally I'd have a little bit more to say, but this is pretty much all the development he gets. Yeah, Red Blaster is definitely somebody who pales by comparison to the legend that is Dirty Duck. After the explosive battle against Red Blaster, Solid Snake makes his way up to the roof where he finds the pigeon and lures it over with some beans and potatoes, and finds a note left behind by Dr. VRAM 01K. After contacting Master Miller to decipher the code left behind by Dr. VRAM, Eggs Benedict finds out that the code is actually a digital number. More specifically, a radio frequency that allows Snake to contact 01K himself. Which would be all well and good if it wasn't for the fact that Dr. VRAM doesn't speak English. Since the Czechoslovakian scientist is unable to talk with Solid directly, he then talks with Dr. Madnar again, who informs him that a woman named Gustava Hefner is able to talk to him. Gustava, of course, being the STB agent that he was informed about earlier. Dr. Madnar goes on to inform Snake that she's currently in disguise in an enemy uniform, hiding within the ranks of the soldiers, and is most likely to be found in the women's restroom. Solid Snake then meets up with Gustava, and we get a little bit of backstory for our newfound ally. Gustava was an Olympic gold medalist at the Calgary Olympics, nicknamed the Ice Princess for her talents, although this tangent is quickly cut off by Gustava in favour of getting to brass tacks by rescuing Dr. VRAM. Gustava informs Snake that Dr. VRAM had told her about a secret passageway to the north of the prison where he's currently being kept, leading to the two to team up and go and rescue him. Upon travelling through the passageway, Snake and Gustava find... Oh, Gustava! Snake! With Dr. Madnod joining the team, the trio head off to search for Dr. VRAM. Unfortunately, their adventure is halted by Dr. Madnar's weak bladder. Snake, wait! I can't go on! I must rest a little. All right, we'll take a short break. So while Dr. Madnar goes off to take a piss, we then get some more character development from Gustava. She talks about how her mother was a World War II survivor, fleeing under the city streets within the sewers, commenting about how their situation is very much alike, as the two of them have been haunted by war. Gustava asks Solid Snake about whether or not he has a family. He replies that he doesn't leading to Gustava to reveal her reasons for being a part of the STB. Namely, that she once had a boyfriend she considered marrying back when she was still an ice skater, a man named Frank Hunter. However, once her bid for asylum in the West was rejected due to political reasons, Gustava's reputation and her family was persecuted, as they were branded as refuseniks, leaving her no choice but to join with the STB. And because of her time in the STB, Gustava ended up leaving a life that severely messed her up, and on top of that, she had never seen the love of her life ever again. You know, there's a lot of negative things I have to say about Hideo Kojima's writing, but this scene right here, fantastic. Maybe I just wasn't expecting this when I first started playing Metal Gear 2, but I really fell in love with Gustava's character and became incredibly invested in her plight and circumstances. And need I remind you, this is all being delivered alone by text boxes and the amazing soundtrack titled Wavelet. Anyway, Dr. Madnar returns and thus the adventure is back on track. Well, until they come across a bridge. I'll go first. 
Nobody will miss me. Yes, of course, Doctor. All except for, uh, you know, Ellen Madnar. You know, your daughter. The one you frequently reminded us is getting married. Kind of flimsy logic there, Doctor. And as expected, disaster strikes as the group are attacked, with Gustava gravely injured as she speaks her last to Solid Snake, sharing an all too bittersweet goodbye as she imparts her Zanzibar land bruise to him, before her last words are of her lost boyfriend, Frank Hunter. And look, before we continue on here, I just have to say... God damn. I mean, I never expected an 8-bit game to tug at my heartstrings, but dude, I was completely torn up when Gustava died. I mean, like Dirty Duck or Jennifer, I kind of just expected all the MSX era characters to just kind of disappear quietly. But I mean, goddamn, for all the emotional moments that the Sword series is heralded for, I think Gustava's death really stands up there as one of my favourite moments in the series, for just how sudden and tragic it all is. She had some decent development with Snake, and her death just really hits home for me. Anyway, Dr. Madnor is taken captive again, as Solid Snake comes to confront front the Metal Gear D, and comes to the shocking realisation that Grey Fox is the one piloting it. He leaves off with Dr. Madnar, and thus Snake sets out to go off and rescue the good Doctor, as well as finding out why Grey Fox had turned traitor on Foxhound. After getting a call from Holly and finding out the secret behind Gustava's brooch, Snake finds a hang glider in her locker, and thus allowing him to follow Grey Fox and Dr. Madnar. But of course, that's not before Solid Snake is confronted by the Four Horsemen. No, not those four horsemen, although these four horsemen are a collective of mercenaries from GSG-9, the SAS, and UDT, who are basically under Big Boss's payroll to take missions only from the big man himself as an assassination squad. Anyway, after dispatching the four horsemen, Snake makes his way to the other side of the chasm, leading to his encounter with the next boss of the game, Jungle Evil. Delving back into his history a little bit, Jungle Evil was once an operative for the South African Special Forces Brigade who fought in Vietnam, and he was famously known for single-handedly destroying two entire troop companies, with many claiming him to be more beast than man. And considering this guy's skills and abilities, I have to ask, where the hell was this guy in the later Metal Gear games? I mean, fuck man, we have all these people bigging up how cool Revolver Ocelot is, or how the ultimate soldier and the ultimate badass the boss is, but to be perfectly honest with you, when we have characters like the Shotmaker or Jungle Evil in the same series, I'm just sitting here wondering, where the hell is their thunderous applause? Anyway, Jungle Evil is defeated, and thus he makes his way throughout the facility, where Snake is then contacted by Kathy Bates, aka his number one fan, who warns him to watch himself. This character has actually appeared earlier on in the game, but I've neglected to mention him up until now, but to be perfectly honest, this character is just completely superfluous to the overall game, so to be perfectly honest, your number one fan isn't really that important. But what Kathy Bates does warn us about is our next boss in the game, Night Fright. Night Fright is the last surviving member of the Whispers, a legendary guerrilla unit who originated the use of optic camouflage technology, and thus earning him the nickname, the Phantom Assassin. Why the Phantom Pain never took the chance to reintroduce Night Fright as a protagonist, I will never know because honestly, this character is just too badass to waste. I mean, hell, Nightfright has such a badass reputation that even the seasoned Foxhound mercenary expert Kassler has his doubts that Solid Snake can even beat him. But anyway, after defeating Nightfright and making his way to the prison cells, Solid Snake finds Dr. Madnight held within, alongside a dead Dr. VRAM 01K. Ah, oh, Snake! You're too late! He's already passed away! His heart just couldn't take it anymore! Wait. What's that bruise on his neck? Even despite his death, Dr. Madnar tells us that Dr. VRAM's oil explants are still safe, and that he's also a really big video game fan, and that he also hid the plans on a microfilm within a Konami MSX cartridge. MSX, that's the world's best leading brand of computer, isn't it? Look, I'm no expert on computer sales or anything, but uh, if I recall correctly, I don't think the MSX sold very well in the West compared to Japan, and that's doubly so considering the fact that Metal Gear 2 wasn't localized for a Western release, so uh, yeah, I think you're kind of overselling yourself there, Solid. Dr. Madnar also tells us that VRAM hid the cartridge inside the locker beside him, with the key itself beyond Dr. Madnar's reach. Where's the key? I don't know. I couldn't get it out of him. Uh, I mean, I, I, he never told me. And now for the moment of truth. Holly contacts Solid and informs him that she did some digging on Dr. Madnar, finding out that after the events of Outer Heaven, things didn't exactly go that well for him in America. Namely, that his radical theories were rejected in the West. Probably because he presented them like this. Dude, this Metal Gear project is totally radical, man! We could, like, give it nukes, and then we could also give it lots of guns! So badass. Anyway, Dr. Manna was dismissed as nothing more than a raving madman, and shut out of the scientific community, so naturally, the only thing left for such a man to do is to turn evil and become a mad scientist. You know, as you do. 
So of course, being the creator of Metal Gear, this got him into talks with Big Boss again, except this time actually willing to work for him, and thus Dr. Madnar allowed Big Boss a technological advantage from both the East and Western parts of the world, directly to Zanzibar land. And of course, Dr. Madnar being so close to Dr. VRAM had given Big Boss all the data he needed to perfectly execute the capture of the man behind the secret of the Oilix formula. Dr. Madnar reveals that all he wanted to do in life was finish his life's work in creating the Metal Gear project, that he had spent tirelessly working on over the decades as he built up his knowledge of robotics. With the US government refusing him in preference for infiltration methods that are a little bit more reflective of the Cold War era rather than an all-out walking battle tank capable of launching nukes, but because Big Boss was willing to take him in, Dr. Madnar was allowed to improve upon the TX-55 Metal Gear he built last time, and thus it was only natural for Dr. Madnar to switch sides, even going as far as to killing off his old friend in order to achieve his plans. And given that Dr. Madnar's entire life was spent working on this, I honestly find Dr. Madnar to be one of the more interesting characters of the Metal Gear series, especially given that he's been retconned out of the franchise for all intents and purposes. But anyway, it's boss time once again with our penultimate boss of the game, Dr. Madnar. Snake, give me the key! Ah, no, it's mine! Solid quickly manages to defeat Dr. Madnar by getting him to mine his own business. <laughs> Am I right? But do you want to know the best part about all this? Dr. Madnar didn't die from that. Yeah, apparently you can survive getting directly blown up by mines because Dr. Madnar actually comes back in Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. Not in the flesh, of course, because, I mean, we wouldn't want to taint the Metal Gear Solid games, you know, godlike and revered as they are, you know, with the evil presence of the MSX games. I mean, what, are you trying to alienate the hardcore fanbase that only ever played from Metal Gear Solid onwards? <laughs> That's just stupid. After retrieving the cartridge, Dr. Madnar has one last talk with Solid about how part of him laments his cynical views upon the world, and tells Snake about the weakness of the Metal Gear D as a parting gift for his daughter. Now, while Dr. Madnar's motives for helping out Solid Snake are left a little bit unclear, on a personal level, I'd like to believe that Dr. Madnar was both torn between his life's work, which is the Metal Gear project, but at the same time though, also feeling a little bit reproachful considering the fact that his daughter Ellen Madnar had gone out of her way and built a life for herself then, you know, considering the fact that she was about to be married, I guess Dr. Madnar felt a little bit guilty about having to destroy all that, considering that Big Boss, well, at the very least by the time of the later games, would have kind of a beef with the uh, Patriots, so... Damned if you do, damned if you don't, I suppose. Anyway, a surprise trapdoor leads Snake down to the lower levels of base, and right into the hands of Grey Fox. The battle between Solid Snake and Metal Gear D begins, as Solid takes the battle tank down with grenades aimed at the knees. Unfortunately, however, upon the destruction of Metal Gear D, Solid's equipment is caught on fire, and so, to avoid burning to death, you're forced to painfully part with pretty much every item you've collected in the game so far. After discarding his gear, Solid confronts Grey Fox in their final battle, with Grey Fox opting to fight him over a minefield. However, However, on a more interesting note, it's Kassler that calls up Solid and tells him a little bit about Grey Fox's past, about how 10 years ago he was a mercenary known as Frank Hunter, and that while he was over in Europe, he fell in love with a woman over in the East. And I think we all know where this is headed. With the West refusing to grant her political asylum, Frank grew to despise the politics of the world and ultimately severing his ties from his lover, Gustava Hefner. And if you'll remember what Frank did just a few hours ago... <laughs> And then this becomes all the more tragic knowing that he just killed his lover. Anyway, Kassler also claims that if he can beat Grey Fox, then Solid Snake will become the greatest mercenary that the world has ever known. After bashing the shit out of Grey Fox, the man breathes his last as he goes over why he betrayed Foxhound. He tells us that Big Boss had saved his life twice, before he even joined Foxhound. The first of which being when he was in Vietnam as a war orphan, forced into a slave labor camp, going on to say that Big Boss had rescued him and all the children who were living in that hellhole. The second time of which being when he was nearly tortured to death in Mozambique. And even despite his hatred of war, like all the kids living in Zanzibar land, Grey Fox, almost like a drug addict dealing with dependency, says that he needs it. That war is all he knows and that because of his experiences growing up around a war-torn world and his time on the battlefield, he can never truly return to a normal life. And this right here is what hit me the most about Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake's story. Keep in mind though, this was years before all the convoluted backstory came into the series, and just looking at this game's plot on its own, you can quite clearly see a lot of the heavy stuff that's going on here. From Schneider joining forces with him, to the little kids in Zanzibar land who look up to him as a father, to even Grey Fox, who looks at him with nothing but respect for the man who not only saved him, 
but gave him purpose. That, to me, is the sign of an incredibly well-written story, taking something so realistically evil about the world, yet at the same time contextualizing it in a way in which people's motivations feel not only three-dimensional, but in some ways, even understandable. And so, ultimately, Grey Fox can't deny conflict, and deep down he always knew that he was destined to die out on the battlefield, knowing that he could never truly make Gustava happy with a normal life, with Frank instead choosing to die out on the battlefield, with Solid Snake swearing that he would never turn out like him. And I have to admit, at the very last sentence here, I kinda tear it up a little. After retrieving the cartridge that Grey Fox had stolen from him, something really weird happens as this random guy just teleports in and starts following Snake as he makes his way towards the final confrontation with Big Boss. The guy just starts shooting at us for literally no reason, and he's only stopped by the fact that he encounters Big Boss. The guy's name is Raiden, and he tells Big Boss that apparently he knew he should have killed him before Raiden teleports away, leaving absolutely no explanation as to who he is or what the hell he was even doing here. Again, I have no idea who the hell this Raiden guy is, but I guess that's a mystery for future games to solve. Anyway, after Raiden's interference, Solid confronts Big Boss once again. Snake, welcome to Zanzibar Land. I knew you'd come back to me. Unfortunately, however, when Solid speaks about the nightmares that he suffered at the hands of Big Boss after what he'd done to him back at Outer Heaven, Big Boss retorts with something that is incredibly creepy. The nightmares, they never go away, Snake. Once you've been on the battlefield, taste of the exhilaration, the tension, it all becomes part of you. And worse yet, he goes on to say that Solid Snake will crave even bigger thrills and have a hunger for battle that can never truly be sated. But the big stinger in all this is Big Boss revealing that he's done all of this just to give a place for people like himself and Snake to live, speaking about how the victims of war and the war orphans will make for fine soldiers in the next generation of warfare. For the sake of showing off how truly devious Big Boss is as a villain, I'll let him explain it. Start a war, vanish flames, create victims, then shave them, train them, and feed them back onto the battlefield. And with that said, this is the true evil of Big Boss's character. His history is unknown to us outside of his reputation as a soldier, but like Grey Fox, I think we can assume that he could never truly turn away from the call of battle, and as such, he knows exactly how to manipulate people into becoming part of his philosophy. He forgives his enemies because he knows that by saving them from a world that scorned them, they will have a place where they can truly flourish under his new world, like in the case of Dr. Madnar and Kyle Schneider. He's more than willing to allow mercenaries in his employ like the Elite Four of Outer Heaven and the Zanzibar Land Armada, considering that they will have a place to call home compared to all the other countries in the world that they've betrayed. And most deviously of all, he knows that this cycle of war will continue, as he takes the war orphans and allows them to grow up under his watchful eye, as they admire him as a father figure for saving them from the conflict and thus would be more willing to become his soldiers, and ultimately have no possible way of them to live a normal life anywhere else. And honestly, given all the detail that we have from Metal Gear 2 alone, honestly, I don't even need a detailed history or backstory for Big Boss, because to be perfectly honest, his philosophy that he states to us in-game perfectly summarizes who he is as a character, which to me, is fantastic. Such a shame, however, that it couldn't unfortunately stay that way. Yeah, as you can probably tell by my snarky attitude, I really do not like Metal Gear Solid 3 very much. But I'm guessing the prevalent question on everybody's lips right now is, how the hell did Big Boss survive getting so many missiles to the face in Metal Gear 1? A radio call from Kastler tells us that despite losing his hands, feet, right eye and ear, he survived thanks to Dr. Madnar's Snatcher program, and that thanks to Dr. Madnar's cybernetics, Big Boss was able to survive. Oh, Venom Snake, your appearance in the series becomes more and more pointless with each passing day. Anyway, Solid and Big Boss square off in the final battle, with Snake managing to defeat his former commander by using an aerosol can and a lighter to create a makeshift flamethrower, and at long last, burning bridges with Big Boss. <laughs> After killing Big Boss, Holly catches up with Solid, and the two go on for some flirty banter. And somewhere out there in the world, you can hear Diane weeping. Solid then makes contact with the Foxhound Chopper pilot, Charlie, who then calls him to the rendezvous point, and thus Snake and Holly set off to meet him there. The two make a run for it, but of course they are being chased by an armada of guards. What the hell is taking them so long? We're gonna be here until Christmas. And now you know the other reason why this is a Christmas review. Charlie swoops in and saves the day as he picks up Solid and Holly, the two hoping that they'll make it back in time for Christmas, while the chopper takes off into the red skies as the credits roll accompanied by my favourite track in the entire game, titled Red Sun. 
After the credits roll, we get a scene back at Foxhound HQ where Colonel Kian Bell, Holly, and Solid open up the MSX cartridge, remarking about how Dr. Kiyomar's name was actually Dr. VRAM01K spelled backwards. Something that is immediately followed up by Solid Snake disappearing, with Holly furious since Snake promised to take her out to dinner. And thus, for a brief moment in time, Diane had finally stopped weeping, for she too, now at last, had a friend who could share in the pain of being ditched by Solid Snake. And on that note, my friends, that was the plot of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Holy hell, where do I begin? For a game made back in 1990 on the MSX of all things, calling Metal Gear 2 ambitious would be an understatement because this game's story is amazing. What could have just as easily have been a cash grab sequel of Beat the Bad Guys in terms of its story, the game turned out to be a roller coaster ride about the psychological nature of warfare, as well as the political struggle that the rest of the world was facing around about the time of this game's release. Admittedly though, the whole East and West dichotomy that was prevalent during 1990 in regards to the European conflict does to some degree age the game, especially since that it was meant to be taking place in 1999. However, that being said, what makes Metal Gear 2 transcend the barrier is with its cast of characters, and the way in which their lives were affected by the horrors of war. I love the amazing development this game had given to its characters like Schneider, Grey Fox, Gustava, and Big Boss because it not only fleshed them out to the point where it made them characters that I care about, but it just made me enjoy seeing their development throughout the course of the game and want to find out what happens to them. But what really hit home for me was the game's commentary on war and really the psychological damage that it inflicted upon its victims, namely in the case of Solid Snake, Schneider, Grey Fox, Gustava, and the war orphans that you find in Zanzibar Land. And the way in which Big Boss manipulated all this conflict to suit his philosophy is something which I find incredibly terrifying in how reasonable he makes it all sound, but ultimately it's just something that I find makes him an incredibly great villain, without having to go the cliché route of giving him a tragic backstory. Needless to say, I love Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake story. Oh my god, and that's just the bloody story sequence. I mean, I've got so much more to cover. I've got the gameplay to talk about, then I've got the technical aspects, and I've got the closing speech, let alone the whole business with this thing right here. Oh jeez, I'm gonna need some more Pepsi for this. Speaking of which, I hope you're having a very Merry Christmas right now. Have a Pepsi. Over to the gameplay side of things, a lot of Solid Snake's moves and gameplay elements from the previous Metal Gear game have remained intact here. Punching, shooting, radio, item, and car key mechanics all make a return from the first game and are all kept relatively intact here. However, unlike the first game, the star ranking system is gone and your ammo and health capacity increase as you take down each boss of the game. In addition, the stealth aspect of the game has been significantly improved. For one thing, Snake's footsteps on certain kinds of areas such as metal grating, certain kinds of sand, and on wooden floors make noticeable sounds, and as a result, the guards will be alerted to your presence much easier than before. Add on to the fact that you've also got to deal with returning cameras, infrared sensors, mines, and patrols that you need to watch out for. However, the guards themselves are still prone to tunnel vision, so just running up to them and punching their light cell when they're at an angle is still an option for you, so they're not quite that advanced just yet. Plus, with the ability to crouch, crawl, and use little hiding spaces, Snake also has quite a few new tricks up his sleeve when it comes to avoiding the enemy. In terms of mission structure, the game follows the events of the story, and unlike last time, the game is nowhere near as guide-reliant as Metal Gear 1, mostly thanks to your support group. Of course I say that, but the most useful allies you're going to be getting here is Holly for her intel on Zanzibar land itself, Kassler for his knowledge and strategies against the game's bosses, and of course Johan Jacobson as the expert in the game's wildlife, and ultimately someone who does come in handy when the situation calls for it. Other than that though, Colonel Kianbel, despite acting like he was a big part of the operation in Metal Gear Solid, barely does a goddamn thing here and honestly, Colonel Kianbel is pretty fucking useless. Eggs Benedict might occasionally charm in with some useful advice like using chocolate to nullify sulfuric acid, but other than that, his advice mostly comes in the form of fourth wall breaking jokes, which honestly proves to be kind of useless outside of flavor text. And as for Dr. Madnar, Dr. VRAM, and Grey Fox, they're mostly relegated to story purposes, so not really much use there. In fact, funnily enough, some of the most helpful bits of advice you're gonna get in Metal Gear 2 actually come from the children of Zanzibar Land often telling the player bits and pieces of information to give them hints on where to go next. Of course, there are a couple of instances every now and again where the player might need to consult a guide to know where to go, but other than that, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is generally a much smoother experience in terms of having the player know where they need to go and what they need to do in order to progress. Bosses this time around are actually pretty cool to fight given some of their strategies. In fact, one small detail I did notice is that there's a definite progression in how you officially fight each boss strategy as you progress throughout the game. Whether it be the hide-and-seek strategy shared by Schneider, Jungle Evil, and Night Fight, or the long-range battles of Red Blaster and the Four Horsemen, 
Metal Gear 2 does give you a little bit more diversity compared to the point and shoot mentality that was in the first game. That and I will never get tired of the fact that the legendary soldier Big Boss was taken out by Solid Snake using a makeshift flamethrower from an aerosol can and a lighter. The only real negative I can find in the gameplay department, and mind you, this is no fault to the game itself, is the tap code that was included with the original game. Now, I'm reviewing the version of the game on the Metal Gear Solid HD collection via Snake Eater, so I don't exactly have a tap code on hand which was available with the original MSX release, but considering the fact that the original game didn't get out of Japan, and you know, outside of that, the game didn't even really come with a tap code in and of itself on a HD collection, this is going to be a major point of contention for a lot of new players. But again, even the tab code thing aside, the gameplay of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is a very solid experience through and through, doing well to complement both the awesome story, as well as providing context to Snake's infiltration. Over to the technical aspects, while the game's visuals aren't exactly award-winning given that 16-bit consoles like the Sega Mega Drive were already making its presence known, I will say that even in spite of its visuals, the game does manage to overcome that in other areas, namely in its writing and music. Not only is the dialogue here vastly more natural than the previous game's efforts of This is Solid Snake, your reply please, but in addition we also at last have the English translation of the game via Snake Eater. And given the fact that Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake took about 16 years to get an official English translation, compared to the several fan translations that cropped up every now and again, I think the biggest question is, why did this game take so long to release in the West? Or more importantly, why the hell wasn't it released in the West at all? The reason of which being is that they didn't want to confuse audience who would have picked up Snake's Revenge, and thus Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was kept as a Japan-only release. Now, don't get it twisted, and maybe this is just me playing on speculation here, but if Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake did have a release in the West, I honestly think this game would have gone down in video game history for shaking up the foundation of not only video game storytelling, but also the stealth genre that this series helped define. I mean, presentation-wise alone, Metal Gear 2 goes above and beyond anything that was expected of games of its era, and to be perfectly honest, this is where I feel Metal Gear 2 can be a game that honestly both fans and newcomers can enjoy. And one part where the game's presentation absolutely shines is in its soundtrack. Coming from somebody who doesn't really like 8-bit music very much, the MSX Metal Gear 2 tracks are some of my favourite tracks in the whole series, and honestly, they're just fantastic to listen to. My favourites of which being Zanzibar Breeze, Under the Cloud of Darkness, Gustava's Death, Wavelet, and my personal favourite of them all, Red Sun. Overall, the presentation of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake pushes the MSX to its limits, but goddamn, does the development team's passion for this title really shine through, because they gave this game their all into making it surpass its predecessor, as well as making it a pretty revolutionary title in its own right. And so, after all this, what are my final thoughts on Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake? Okay, if it wasn't obvious enough already, I love this game. Save for one other Metal Gear game in the series that we'll get to around Christmas of 2019, I'm hard pressed to call Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake my favourite game in the Metal Gear series. Again, I can't judge Kojima's non-Metal Gear works save for Zone of the Enders and Snatcher, but to me, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is one of the best stories he's ever written by far. I was absolutely hooked into the story's divulgence into war, as well as the development it gave to characters like Dr. Madnar, Schneider, Gustava, and Big Boss. The gameplay has seen significant improvements in its stealth mechanics, and this combined with some catchy music which complements the game's story, as well as its atmosphere. Honestly though, in terms of recommendations to newcomers of the modern generation who are worried that Metal Gear 2 might be a little bit too archaic, I say give the game a shot. It might take a bit of getting used to, but if you're invested enough in the game's story and want to find out what happens to characters like Solid Snake, Gustavo, Holly, and everyone who's involved with the Zanzibar Land Armada, then honestly, you're in for one hell of a roller coaster ride. And for those of you who are Metal Gear veterans and have only ever played the games from Metal Gear Solid and beyond, play this game now, that is an order. You are doing yourself a huge disservice by not playing Metal Gear 2, because for all the backstory that you might hear Colonel Kian Bell mention about Big Boss and Metal Gear Solid, yeah, all of that goes down right here. Well, minus a retcon here or there, but I'll save that for when I tackle Metal Gear Solid next year. And on that note, with the review itself out of the way, I have just one last question to answer for you. Which I'm guessing is probably a point of contention for both Metal Gear fans and, well, viewers of mine as well. Why did I bother taking a look at the two MSX released Metal Gear games? I mean, since most people started with Metal Gear Solid on the PS1 anyway, and the fact that the Metal Gear MSX titles are rarely mentioned at all in the later games, and even if they are mentioned, they're retconned out of existence anyway, so why bother? And to give you an answer to that question, here's why. 
Out of all the Metal Gear games that are covered to death, the ones that you always hear about are games like Metal Gear Solid, Snake Eater, or The Phantom Pain, and really how games like that are, for one reason or another, fantastic games to some people. And again, while opinions on those games will vary, especially in the case of The Phantom Pain, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I do have one thing to say about it, which is, while I do have a lot of respect for video games like Metal Gear Solid to breathing new life into the franchise, which could have ostensibly been just another relic of video game days gone by, at the same time, however, I feel as if these games in particular on the MSX hold so much more to offer than a lot of Metal Gear fans tend to give it credit for. Now, obviously the fact that most people didn't have a chance to play Metal Gear, and especially Metal Gear 2 at the time of release, probably doesn't help that much, but I feel as if people always skim by these two games as if it holds such little importance in the grand scheme of things, but honestly, while the later entries in the series, most especially with the Big Boss trilogy of Snake Eater, Peace Walker, and the Phantom Pain, attempting to retcon the MSX duology in order to fit Kojima's new lore and history for the franchise, I feel that by showing you all the MSX games and what they had to offer in terms of its themes and well-crafted story and characters, it'll allow me to better express my opinions as we get to the games from Metal Gear Solid onwards. Again, don't get it twisted, I don't want to say that it's all downhill from here, but after everything that Metal Gear 2 had done, and honestly just how much I've come to appreciate the game each and every time I play it, the more my apathy just grows for the Metal Gear games that followed on. But it's not all doom and gloom for the Metal Gear series, because believe it or not, the best is yet to come! Well, for me in 2019 anyway, but I'll get to Metal Gear Solid 2 when I get to it. So, now we've finally reached the end of the video, and of course since it's, well, the end of the series, and plus it's also Christmas, what better time than now to not break Christmas tradition by having one of those soppy little messages that people like to do, because it encourages goodwill and good-heartedness, even though I'm pretty sure a lot of them don't care, but I love you people! And I honestly, seriously do mean that. I've, like, jumped in subscribers, which I mostly attribute to the Infinite video, but that's another story entirely. So, before I ramble on off-topic anymore, I just have this to say. Thank you for sticking with Scully Reviews throughout its third season. I mean, Jesus, man, I never thought I'd make it past episode three of season one, but I made it. 2017? Ugh. I'll talk about this a little bit more in, an, in a separate video that I'll probably upload a little bit later, but, uh, as it stands now, thank you guys so much for fucking sticking with me, man. It's been a fantastic voyage. From Sonic the Hedgehog to Apocalypse, and from Demonic Toys to, uh, Jack and Daxter. Again, it's been a- again, in terms of reviews, it's been a pretty fun ride, and I'm honestly glad that a lot of you people have stuck with me. You dudes, dudettes, and dude meisters, I am never gonna say that ever again, have been the best, so thank you for keeping it new metal. And secondly, for those of you just joining us with this review, uh, hi. Anyway, jump cut, because I honestly couldn't keep this going up any further, I am Scully, keep it new metal, have a very metal Christmas, and, well, I think it's about time that I resolved a certain plot point. Catch you later.